Yes, hello and welcome to my tutorial video about uh, convolutional narrow neural networks, um, which is part of the dance uh, workshop uh, March 2022. My name is uh, Daniel Wenz and I am a member of Xenon Anton. And in my tutorial, I used uh, CNN to show on a very simple example how you can use CNN to do some binary classification and you can find the material I worked on and developed during this two weeks workshop in, uh, in the dance uh, repository so when you search for dance organization you can find down here you can find the tutorial if you go to the tutorial, you can uh, download the material, install the requirements as described down here, and then you can directly dive into the tutorial. Um, the repository is structured such that you have just a single notebook with the tutorial itself, and then you have some additional tools uh, which were developed in order to, um, uh, to allow uh, for this for this project basically to allow people to have a some simulated data so it's a toy simulation which we will see in a second so when you download the material uh, you have the same structure and uh, then you can dive in directly into the tutorial so uh, in this tutorial video i will briefly go through the individual steps but as you can see it's also all written out so uh, you can also after watching the video or at every time in the video you can just pause it and then read the uh, the text and also explore the code by yourself and see uh, if you can familiar familiarize yourself with the problem so the classification problem i want to describe here can be fairly generalized i think to many experiments so in my case, I wanted to do some binary classification given some data. I wanted to classify it either as background or as uh, data-like. And in particular, I was interested in developing some classification for our neutron vetoes. So here in the image, you see the new Xenon-Anton experiment and uh, cut impression of this experiment. You see in the very center, uh, liquid xenon dual phase TPC, which is used for the search of dark matter. And this TPC is surrounded by this uh, octagonal shaped structure, which is our water trunk of neutron veto, which is equipped with 120 PNTs uh, um, arranged in 20 columns, which you see over here. And then you have this uh, reflective EPTF uh, 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 housing, basically, which is surrounding the, the TPC cryostat wall. And this basically is our neutron veto. And so the idea here was to, to classify signals of the neutron veto, which are neutron capture signals we're interested in. So the neutron veto has the purpose that if you have neutrons going into the dark matter detector, backscattering into the water Cherenkov detector, that you want to veto those neutrons because they are uh, uh, dark matter-like. So this is a background which is very dangerous for, for WIMP dark matter searches. And so we want to classify and compare these type of signals to other background signals. And the majority of our neutron veto background is coming actually from the PNTs of our neutron veto. And here we have uh, different uh, radioactive isotopes and decay chains. So for example, uranium morphorium chain, which uh, produces the majority of all backgrounds. And so you have a very distinguished topology to neutron capture signals. And therefore we want to be able to classify the two. To give you an idea, so here I do some, some basic imports to, to start this toy simulator. So I wrote for this, especially for uh, specifically for this tutorial, I wrote uh, some uh, toy MC where you can very quickly generate large statistics of fake events and um, play a little bit with, with, with these events. And so that the, really the classification with CNNs is the, the main topic of this uh, uh, tutorial. However, I also wanted to provide you some, really some simulator and not just some data set um, so that you already can also maybe modify the data toy a little bit around and, and see how things changes. 
So what is the basic idea? The basic idea is illustrated in this figure. So uh, imagine uh, that we take now the neutron V2 and we just sit in the XY plane. So we forget about the Z dimensions. We just take now one of these PMT rows and just focus for the moment of one of on one of these PMT rows. To simplify the issue, then you can see this two-dimensional image here. And what you see here in these dots are the, the light sensors, how they are arranged in these 20 columns. And uh, what you also can see is that some of the dots are red, some are blue. And this has to do with the fact that depending on where you have the light emission in the neutron V2, you can either illuminate PMTs directly or you can only illuminate PMTs indirectly because you have the huge PMT, cry uh, the, the TPC cryostat in the center of the detector. So depending on where your light emission is, and in this particular example, it's still illustrated by this orange diamond. Um, your uh, light propagation is slightly different. And this you can now exploit for this uh, binary classification I was speaking about. You can also see at the PMTs, you have the different um, uh, times when the photons arrive. And in this simple, simple toy Monte Carlo, what I assume is I, I simply compute the direct path flight path, check what is the flight time. If it's an indirect uh, flight time, then I check, okay, first order of magnitude, what is the flight path to any of the directly illuminated PMTs? And then from there, what is the shortest path to illuminate uh, the next PMT? So what is the totally shortest uh, uh, travel time to, to somehow mimic this reflective behavior in a very, very simplified way that it uh, suits our purpose, but still can be uh, is somewhat close to reality. So this is for a neutron-like signal. Neutrons are getting captured close to the TPC cryostat. So you have the light production close to the cryostat of the neutron capture. You convert it to gamma. The gamma produces Compton, and then you get the chunk of light. And so the light production is also closer to the TPC cryostat. If you go to our background, I already said that mo the majority is coming from uh, radioactive decay chains from, from the PMTs itself. So you can also have here the emission of a gamma. And here you have the chunk of light produced closer to one of the PMTs. And you see already now that this uh, illumination pattern basically changes. You have more PMTs, which you can illuminate directly. You see that the nearest neighbors are illuminated more quickly, as in this case. And so you can use this information about time, but also uh, in position. So basically, if you if we reduce the problem into just one PMT row, it's an angular position. Basically, you have time, angular position, so two dimensions. And uh, if you want, uh, you can also add the recorded charge as a third dimension. And so this is a very basic problem, which you can think of like an image. So you have an X, uh, you have pixels on one axis, time on the, or the angular position on one axis, time on the other axis, and then the intensity of the image uh, as your Z component, basically. And this is why I wanted to use uh, CNNs for this problem to see if it leads to somewhere and if we can do in fact this this type of classification. So if we produce now a certain number of events and this is done here in the cell, so what you produce are basically timestamps of the photons at which PMT they are, uh, which a fraction of charge is recorded and here are some quantities to change the behavior, for example, the number of recorded photons. Um, how the charge is drawn, how many events you want to create. You can read it in the text in more detail what these parameters do, but if we plot the behavior, you see it like here in this uh, plot. So you have here the PMT channel or the angular position, so the position uh, of the corresponding PMT column. And along the x-axis, you have the time uh, in nanoseconds, so our neutron V2 has a very fast digitizer for exactly this purpose. Um, of about two nanoseconds here, we use an even uh, larger, uh, even finer binning just for illustration. So, and then you can see that you have here this cone-like structure as you would also expect from, from these type of suits. And if you look then for, for background, then this cone-like structure looks a little bit different. And this small difference is the information we want to use to discriminate between the two signals. So the first thing we need to do is now with our fake signals to 
create images. And so what I do here in the cell is just creating, uh, again, the, the time information, channel information, charge information. And then I have another function in this class which converts these informations into basically images depending on the sampling you want to apply. So also here you can apply a little bit with finer, coarser sampling. And um, so, and then you can create the images and this is shown here. So you see uh, images for the neutrons on, on the left-hand side, images for the gammas on the right-hand side. Again, you have here angle line time. And now you see if it's not a histogram, but individual images, it's already more difficult by eye at least for you, for at least for me to tell what is neutron, what is, uh, what is gamma. But hopefully our uh, machine learning application will be able to do it. One thing which is always a big point when you now dig into CNNs and, and these kind of stuff and what you will find in many tutorials is that they will provide you with some, some image libraries and that preparing your data from these image libraries is one of the biggest things to do before actually training your, your neural network. This is, I think, slightly different in science, I would say, because in science, it's not like that you have a bunch of images with different, I don't know, illumination settings, different coming with different sizes and so on and so forth. So this image processing step, which is often um, stated as one of the, the, the larger important uh, parts uh, is a little bit reduced in our case, because we know already very well how our data looks like and what our data is supposed to be. So in our case, what we need to do and as for other image processing steps, since our images will already always have the same shape because we produce the data ourselves, is just to normalize the data between zero and one. This is one thing uh, what is usually done in these kind of applications to, to, um, to get good results and you can think of our images which we have seen so far as basically grayscale images because we have just one color information and we just normalize our images according to the, the, the maximum charge. And then uh, the second thing which we need to do is the data labeling and splitting. So when you see these tutorials and read uh, the, the different information is that you have to label your data and uh, labeling your data basically means to when you train your CNN, it's supervised learning. So you don't only provide images, but you also have to provide labels such that the computer can learn, okay, to which category does which image belong. And this is uh, at least for TensorFlow, I don't know, it's for different uh, libraries. It is done in a way that you, um, have to specify depending on how many classification categories you have. You have an array uh, with a certain set of dimensions and whenever you have a certain categories, for example, this category displayed in this first row is true, then you set this basically for this image to one. In uh, this particular case, only the second image belongs to category one, while the other images belong to the category two. And so this is done in this cell. And then also one thing what you also always need to do is splitting your data into a validation and training data set. And we will see in, in a short moment why this is important. And you should also always make sure. So what we created up to now is a background images and uh, signal images. So what we want to do is also to shuffle them. So that when we train that the data set is well shuffled and that um, basically when you train now on a batch of images that you always have a certain number of signal images but also a certain number of background images for better training. So this is what we do here. We basically take our data, put background and uh, neutron data together, shuffle the images and also the labels and then we can also in the last step split our data into training data set which we will use to train our uh, application to, to perform the task and uh, having some validation data. And as I said, we will also see in a minute why this is necessary. And usually what people are using is an 80-20% splitting between training and validation. 
you can also play here a little bit around with different uh, ratios if you like. Um, but for the moment, I just stayed with the default one. And after we did all this, we can just loop over our uh, training data and see how it looks like. So these are now our grayscale images normalized in area. So as I said before, you have on the one axis the angular component, uh, on the y axis, on the x axis, you have the time component, this time in two nanosecond samples. And in the color scale, you have basically the fraction of recorded charge by the individual kinties normalized such that the scale goes just up to one. And then you see as of the title, the different labels, and you will see that the data is now shuffled, that we have both neutron signals, and background signals. And so we can pass this to our application, which we want to, to learn. So before we start with CNNs, I want to introduce a little bit. Uh, I want to go one step back and now start first using fully connected neural networks. And for this, we're using, uh, uh, or in general, we're using in this tutorial uh, TensorFlow for our applications. And so we're importing here some, some libraries, which we use. We will always use the sequential model. We will need the stance and flatten layer to construct our neural networks. So let me skip the code a little bit to show you first this graph to explain a little bit what's going on. So this you may have seen already several times when you came in touch with uh, machine learning or with uh, uh, yeah, talks about machine learning is, is this typical image where you have like the fully connected, uh, uh, fully connected neural network. So you have a layer here, then you have a second layer of neurons here and the output layer here. And usually people refer to this layer in the middle, or if you have many layers in the middle as hidden layers, then you have here an input layer and here your output layer. And so what these neurons do basically, you compute certain values. So for example, the value Z2, depending on your inputs x1 and x2 and the corresponding weights you assign here. And these weights are the things which will, which our neural network will learn in the end. So these are the things which are optimized. In general, you can think about machine learning as a very complicated fitting, multidimensional fitting, if you like. So you maybe have heard in your courses that fitting, for example, chi-squared fitting works in a way that you try to minimize a loss function. And in, in this type of machine learning applications, it's basically the same idea. So you're computing now these weights based on some loss function. So you basically check, you compute your final outputs in the output layer and compare it to the label. And uh, depending on um, if, if your prediction was good or was not so good, you adjust the weights back then uh, to, to minimize basically the loss function and to optimize weights. That's the basic idea. And in general, you compute the, the value of a certain neuron with a very simple formula. So you have basically a bias term, which is a constant term. For example, for Z2, you have this one bias term plus the sum over all the inputs. So in case of Z2, we have two input arrows, which is given by X1 multiplied with W12 and X2 multiplied with W13. So you sum this up and then you usually pass this to some activation function. And this activation function is usually a non-linear function. Um, I don't want to go into the very deep here. So this you have to do in a, in a real lecture. So this is really more hands and hands supposed to be in hands on tutorial how you do this in Python. But for example, in this particular example, we always will encounter two nonlinear activation function. One is the so called RILU function, which is very popular. And this function is actually very simple. So let me make a small sketch. So if we have uh, X and Z, Sorry, X and Z. The RILU function is basically uh, zero if your number is negative, and then it's just uh, proportional to X if you're in the positive regime. So this is a very simple non-real, uh, non, 
um, linear function. And the softmax function is a function which allows you to project R uh, onto the numbers between zero and one. This is important. Uh, the softmax function is important since we have this binary classification in the end. And classification, we usually want to uh, state in percent. So having numbers between zero and one is a natural choice here and the softmax function, we can also check it looks something like this, basically. So these are the functions we are using as activation functions. And uh, we want to start here in this example, very simple, we want to start with some simple model and it, it's not getting much more complicated than uh, what I'm already showing down here. So we have uh, an input layer, uh, sorry, no, uh, we have uh, an input which is uh, directly flattened. So we're not doing big things with our image. We want to start simple. We just load our image, we make it flat. So instead of having a two dimensional uh, image, we basically make it flat a single dimensional array. Then we have in our first layer, we have 100 neurons. In the second, we have 50. And as an output layer, we have only two values. And this is because we have a binary classification. We want to classify our signal, signal or our signal background. So we just need to. And here we need the softmax to have this probabilistic-like uh, output between 0 and 1. So uh, to realize a model, and now let's look at the code, we usually use in, in TensorFlow the sequential model, which is quite nice because you ju can just initialize this class basically, and then you can add different layers as I already described. And then you have already your first model. And then you can basically print a summary, which is a quite nice function. So you can again see here, um, we have the first stage, as I said, is the input loading and the flattening. So if you remember, we have 20 samples at what, 20 PNC columns, so 20 rows, if you like. If, you, if we go back to our images, we have 20 rows. And in time, we have 16 bins. So 20 times 16 is 320 input shape, makes sense after flattening. And so if we connect those, with our 100 neurons, we have 320 times 100 weights, these individual weights, which gives you the 32,000 uh, parameters. Plus we have these 100 additional bias terms for each of these neurons. So you get the additional 100. Then in the next layer, we have uh, uh, only 50 times 100 parameters plus 50. And then in the last stage, we have 50 times 2 times 2. So this makes sense. This is the total number of parameters. And this is fairly small. So this is something where you need to get a feeling when you now start playing with it. What is a large number of parameters? In general, for sure, it's better to have a smaller number of parameters if you can perform the same task. Um, but 30,000 parameters is fairly small. So how do we now uh, use this model? So the next step is that we have to compile it. Um, when you compile it, you have to, as I said, you have to, uh, our problem is, um, is an optimization problem. So you have to specify which loss function you want to use. In case of a binary problem, you can use this binary cross entropy, which you can also read up on how it looks like. Uh, it's not really not complicated. And then as an optimizer, this is a more challenging thing. This can depend on your application. For the beginning to, to start simple, I'm using the so-called Adam optimizer, which is adaptive movement estimation. And what this means basically is that uh, if you imagine now you have your multi-dimensional uh, loss landscape, since we have this multidimensional uh, minimization problem. What you need to do to optimize your problem to find the lowest point in your loss function, you have to compute the negative gradient, which is pointing downward in uh, to smaller loss values. And then you have to move a step in this direction of, of your loss value. 
And so uh, the, the length of these steps um, is the so-called learning rate. And if you use, depending on which optimizer you use, this learning rate can be a constant, which you can adjust, or in the case of this Adam optimizer, it's computed for you and uh, depending on where you are on your loss function it is changed and for the beginning um, we will use that optimizer since um, it will simplify the issue a little bit for us uh, but this you should also read up because depending on the optimizer you can run into a few caveats for example imagine you have now this multi-dimensional complicated um, uh, loss surface and uh, if for example your learning rate is too small then it could be that you get stuck in a local minimum while a global minimum might sit right next to it and you cannot come out of this local minimum because your learning rate steps are too small so the optimizer thinks okay when i go a little step to the left a little step a little bit step to the right then uh, my loss function will increase and so i'm not doing this step and so this is a little bit of challenge and uh, needs a little bit of, let's say, advanced guessing what you need to do. I think this lead, needs a little bit of expertise. And uh, But for the moment, I think we can start with this Adam optimizer. The last thing you have to specify is also some metric, uh, which you want to use for the optimization. And usually you put your accuracy. You can also put other metrics. Um, but as I said, we want to start something. And so uh, this is already it. You can already now start to predict um, what is the chance that a certain image is either neutron or background. And so, for example, let us get the predictions for the first 100 of our images and then maybe check for the very first image what's its prediction and it says that it 50 percent of the case it might be background but it might be also a neutron signal so this is not very convincing but maybe this was just this one image let us plot the confusion matrix um, for these 100 predictions and see what the outcome is so um, this is the confusion matrix and you see here uh, the true positives down here the false negatives and uh, here you see the number of background events classified as neutrons and up here the number of neutrons classified of background and you see it's fairly random it's basically 50 50 it's just guessing and this is not surprising because at the moment we just initialized and compiled our model but we didn't train it yet so we initialized some weights and getting a 50 50 percent response just shows us that we did some random uh, initialization of our weight parameters here uh, up here so um, down here we are starting to train it I don't I won't run this now in this video but basically what you're doing you always have to specify a batch size and the number of epochs you want to train and the batch size basically means how many images do you take to compute the gradient I was talking before that you have this gradient following now your loss surface function or even multi-dimensional loss function and so um, the batch size means uh, this is the number of so or let me start differently so if you now want to compute the gradient you could use all the available information to, co to compute the gradient basically taking all the images to compute this gradient this is this basically means that you would um, compute for a very long time just to make a single step in a certain direction. However, so what can be more helpful when you want to train all your applications to get some, to train it faster, you uh, is that you compute the gradient based on some average over a certain number of images. So in this you specify usually as batch size. So batch size is how many images are used to compute this gradient before you do this step. And uh, um, so depending on this, you have uh, uh, different, de depending on this, you have a certain number of, uh, let's say, training cycles for each epoch. And epoch basically means, so imagine now we have a fixed set of data. In our example above, I think we simulated just 1,000 images for both. 
uh, let me see. Yes, we just simulated 1000 images. And uh, so if you have a batch size of 128 and you just take 80% of images, then you can see that you have seven, seven cycles. So you can have uh, seven times compute the gradient and take a step along your loss function. And since this is not enough, what you usually also do is you specify a number of epochs you want to train. So basically after each epoch, you take again all your 1000 images, you shuffle them again, and then you start restart the training. And in this way, you can start to train your, your uh, neural network. And so let's see how the predictions work out after training. So after training, we see that uh, if we ask for the predictions, we get a 100% accuracy, which is good. And if you're a physicist, you already know, basically, this is usually too good. 100% accuracy sounds suspicious. And you should be indeed suspicious. And um, the thing is, we get here 100% accuracy because I used the training data for checking the neural network. And this is why it was so important to split between training and validation data. If we do the very same with our validation data, we see, in fact, that it's not uh, that the accuracy is in fact not 100%, that we have a few misclassifications. And uh, so why is that? Why do we get for the training data 100% accuracy, but for the validation data not? The, the reason is that at some point, depending on how complex our problem is or how large our training data set is, our neural network will memorize the, the input data. And so it simply memorizes which image belongs into which category. And therefore, for the training data, it can achieve a 100% accuracy. But if you confront now your application with some data which it did not train onto some unknown data, then it will usually perform worse. And this you can also plot as a function of the learning epoch. So, you see here in, in purple always the training data and orange always the validation data. And you have in this plot here the accuracy versus the number of epochs. And then you can see basically that for the training data after like 40 epochs, we reach a 100% accuracy. While for the validation data, we actually had a, the highest accuracy around, I don't know, eight to 10 ish uh, uh, training epochs. And after that, it's decreased a little bit, but then also stayed fairly constant. And if you lost, look at the loss function, you see a similar picture. So for the training loss, the loss function becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. While for the validation data, you see that around 18, um, 18 epochs, you have the lowest minimum in your loss function. And after that, the loss function of your validation data is basically rising again. And so what happens here is also has a name, it's called overfitting. What you also basically know from your stats classes is that, for example, if you fit a polynomial to your data and you don't have enough data points, is that you basically in the end uh, just uh, um, connect each of the data points with your function and therefore you, you're overfitting your, your model. You have a perfect fit, but the fit doesn't represent your data anymore or doesn't model your data anymore. And there are certain things you can do to avoid overfitting, one thing I want to just quickly show here, because it might be important for your later application if, if it gets more complicated, are so-called dropout layers. And what the dropout layers do, so we are creating here a new neural network. You see again, we have the floating layer, then our layer with a densely connected layer with 100 neurons with 50 and two. And we just basically specify in between these dropout layers. And the dropout basically means it's not adding anything, but it will randomly after in each training cycle, it will randomly switch off certain neurons. And therefore this prevents, uh, this randomness prevents the neural network a little bit from overfitting. This is one thing you can do. And in the following, we're checking that, but you see it's not really changing much. If you look again in accuracy and validation data. And so, um, if this doesn't help, what you usually can do, depending on your application, and always depends, is you can increase your training data. So far, we had just used 1,000 images, which is not really 
much. So we redo the images, but this time we take 10,000 images and uh, repeat the whole procedure. So again, we are creating here our new network. We are compiling things and again, train it. And then you can see that basically with even more data, the same thing happens even earlier here of the eight epochs or so. So this basically means that uh, that our neural network cannot do better at this point. So would that we achieve basically the best possible classification here around, uh, uh, let's say 83, 84% with this fully connected layer and that at an early stage you have this uh, overfitting. So there's not much you can do. So let's move, let us move to a more complicated case. And this is a convolutional neural network. And the idea behind a convolutional neural network is basically coming from, yeah, from different fields. So if you think about, again, we have our images, uh, if we have them up here, or let's let me go to the histograms. If you look at these histograms, you see that we have certain information clustered in certain regions. So, so for example, you can see here in this region, looks a little bit different from, or this region over here, and the signal looks a little bit different from background signal over here. And so CNNs are always strong in these uh, spatially correlated informations. For example, in, in it's heavily used in image recognition and uh, convolutional networks work on the basis that you, let me go back, that you have uh, convolution as the name suggests and pooling layers. Uh, and these convolution and pooling layers help to recognize spatial information. So the idea you can imagine it in a very simple way. Take for example, my face in this video, to recognize my face as a face, you have to first recognize contours of my face. So for example, you have to recognize somehow that I'm wearing glasses and that here's my nose and then I have here my, my mouth. And so you first need to know contours of my face, basically the edges in my face that you can see these individual objects. And this is where convolution plays a, a role. So if you, for example, did uh, photography or uh, image processing, you, then you know that there are certain kernel filters to detect edges. And these filters basically work on the principle that you have an image, like illustrated here with numbers. And then you multiply these images with a certain filter, depending uh, on the filter size. So for example, take a free by free filter and now you have this filter and you can uh, basically put numbers in this filter. And what you then do is basically multiplying the values and summing them up to new values. So for in this particular example, if the filter would be just flat filled with, uh, would be just the unitary matrix, just filled with one, 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 one you would get here now the number five if you multiply it with this. But it doesn't make much sense, but uh, with uh, only ones as values, but uh, this is basically how it works. So for example, if you want to detect edges, horizontal or vertical edges, then you would uh, fill only horizontally the, the matrix with ones and uh, or vertically with ones if you want to see vertical or horizontal edges. And so the idea here is basically that you're not specifying these uh, these kernels prior to your problem that you don't put them uh, basically that you don't define them, but that you let the computer decide what are the best convolution uh, uh, kernels to identify my problem. So basically to, for example, identify contours in an face and after you can identify contours uh, in, in, in the image, you might be able to identify objects like the mouth, the eyes. And when you identify mouth and eyes, you may recognize the image as an as a face. And that's the basic idea behind convolutional neural networks. And so you have these kernels filtering across your image to basically group together spatial information, detect edges, if you like, and these kind of things. This is what the convolution should do. 
And then the other thing, what you usually do when you do convolution is padding. So usually you want to have that your image keeps the same shape. So in this upper example, if you would now go with this three by three matrix across this five by five matrix, your resulting matrix would be also three by three because you would compute the values of these numbers, then of these numbers, and then of these numbers. So your image would shrink. And you usually don't want this, you want to have the same shape. And so what you usually do is that you pad your image with zeros and then you can just keep the same shape in the end. So this is one thing, the convolution. And the other thing what you usually do um, is the so-called max pooling. Um, so this is also quite simple. If you have a matrix, the max pooling just takes the maximum number in this uh, in this region here, so in this case seven. And you do this to reduce the information, to keep only the most relevant information. And for images, it makes more sense because it also helps you to denoise your image. So if you have noise in your image, you always just want to keep the sharpest feature. So the values with the highest contrast values, with the highest color values. And this is why you do max pooling. It can be also the very same for our application. I mean, you can have noise in your sensors, your light signals are, might be larger than your noise. And so max pooling might make sense to um, discriminate between uh, important features from real signals compared to, to PMT noise or something like that. And so now, as I said uh, before, the idea in these convolutional neural networks is that you first I want to identify the contours, then the mouth, and then the face. And so you usually have typically convolution and max pooling layers multiple times right after each other. And in this particular example, we start again our sequential model. Then we add a convolutional layer where we have a three by three matrix. So the same as shown up here. And we have eight of them. So we let now, when we train our data, we let now the computer decide, okay, you have now eight of these three by three matrices assign the values into these matrices, the weight values into these matrices as you please, as it minimizes the problem. And uh, after that, do a max pooling and the max pooling is done on a two by two array. And then we repeat the same, but this time we take 16 kernels instead of just eight. And then we do again a max pooling. And uh, after these steps, what you usually do in a CNN is that you flatten your data again, like we did before. So you make a flat array. And then you make this densely uh, co connected uh, neural network as we had it before. So with 200 neurons, 100 neurons, and two classification neurons. The uh, compiling stays the same. So we have still binary cross entropy as our loss function. We have the same optimizer and asymmetric accuracy. And again, we can print the summary. And you can see that this time we have already some more parameters because now whenever we perform these steps we get an additional feature space or we gain in, in feature space so if you compared before we were only one dimensional but this time so you see that uh, after the first convolution our image is uh, still 20 by 16 but has an additional dimension eight instead of just a single dimension. Before we just had the color information, but this time we increase our channel information, this color channel information by eight. So instead of just having now an image, you can imagine it as having, a, yeah, as, an, as a block, basically. You have, you have a block of data and uh, this eight refers to the eight currents you have. And you see that later we have 16 feature channels but uh, we only have uh, 10 and 8, uh, um, a dimension of 10 and 8 in the, in the channel dimension and in the time dimension because we do this max pooling, which is 2 by 2. So this means we reduce this dimension by 2 and this dimension by a factor of 2. And you see that's done by this max pooling. And uh, so in the end, you see, but when we flatten our data, uh, that we have much more. Um, yeah, much more parameters. So this time we also increase, increase the batch size, but therefore reduce a little bit the number of epochs and we can still redo the training. 
And now you see that we achieve a much better accuracy uh, or what, maybe not much better, but better. So before we were around 83 and now with this very simple CNN, we can already achieve accuracies which are around 92-ish, 93-ish percent with training, but also with validation data. And so it's already much better. So you see that CNN really helps to for this problem because we have this data which is um, has different properties in, in, in spatial information and these time informations for CNN are quite good in classification. So the same in the loss function. Um, when you're satisfied, you also can always save uh, your model. Usually it is an HDF5 file. So this is done here. And then later you can just load again your model and then do your predictions or whatever you want to do. So this is now how the basic principle of uh, how the basic idea of CNN works. Um, this is what we learned so far. And since this is more an enhanced on tutorial also with TensorFlow and uh, this problem or your problem might be even much more complicated in reality, I want to spend now the second half of this tutorial more on customizing things with TensorFlow. And so the first part is about callback functions. Callback functions are can be simple functions, can be different functions to further customize your learning. And one thing is, for example, making a checkpoint of your model. So now we only saved our model in the end, but we already have seen with this overfitting that this might be not the thing we want to do. We don't want to save our model after 100 epochs because here it's apparently worse than before. And so you can use callbacks for exactly that to stop your training early or to save your model at the point where you have achieved the lowest uh, validation loss or the highest validation accuracy. And this is basically done with this model checkpoint function. So uh, you can specify a file name, then you can, for example, save only the weights or even more information. This is depending on your purpose or, or, or your needs. And uh, you can also read what this, uh, you can also check the always the, the information of these function for more uh, the help of these functions for more information, which is quite good in TensorFlow. Um, but for here, for this example, we only will save the weights. And then you can, for example, also specify if you only want to save uh, the best uh, values or if you want to save your data in certain frequencies, uh, which depend on uh, how many training data you have, how large your batch size is, and so on and so forth. So here we just reinitialize our model like we always did before. We're just creating a new sequential model. And then we start again the training. And then you can see that here at some points, we're saving our model always with different checkpoints. And this we do throughout the training. And then you can just load a certain checkpoint if you like. Uh, if this, for example, corresponds to, to the time where you have had the highest uh, validation accuracy, for example. But as I said, you can also just save uh, the best model only. Some other callback which might be helpful. So for example, I was talking before about the batch size and epochs and training time. So a time callback can be quite helpful in that case to see what is the most efficient way to train my model. And this callback, you can also check on, on TensorFlow itself on the documentation offers you different functions which are called on different stages of the training so this is now a customized callback just to show you how you can write your own so we're doing something on the beginning of the training on the beginning of an epoch on on the end of an epoch and what we basically do is we have a list with epoch starts a list with epoch ends and we initialize when the training started and whenever the uh, an epoch starts, we just store the time when this is, and when an epoch ends, we store the time when an epoch ends. And the nice thing about these callback functions is that you just can stack them on top. Um, so when I do uh, what I do here, I initialize again the checkpoint callback, we initialize again the model, 
uh, set the number of epochs. And this time we have two callbacks functions. So you have here once the function, uh, the safe callback. And then we also have this time our timer callback, which we initialize up here and just specify down here. And so we have this timer callback also running. And this means we basically can now plot our accuracy, not only as a function of epochs, but also as a function of training time, if you like. And uh, then you can also even specify more complicated callback functions, depending on your needs. You can also do it on different stages of your training. Really, please check out for that, the documentation of TensorFlow for more information. So if you go now to more complex models, um, so far, we always state very simple. You also want maybe to define your own layers and this for two reasons. One reason is that if your model becomes very complicated, you don't only want to specify always, okay, I have a convolution layer, followed by a max pooling layer, always three by three kernels, always two by two kernels. And so imagine we would have, I don't know, like 20 of these stages, which is, uh, it would be just, annoying to always write this, right? So what you can do, you can write your own layer with uh, uh, by inheriting from the TensorFlow layer class and uh, write, for example, your own convolution layer. And what I mean with own convolution layer is basically that we do initialize here the convolution layer, what we usually used here, and the user can specify the number of kernels and the kernel size. But this will be always followed by a two by two max pooling layer. And uh, these self defined layers are always divided in an init function, in a build function. And the, this build function is important because here you know the input shape of the current uh, layer because you need to specify for each layer what is its corresponding input shape. If you remember, this is what we always saw in this. Uh, summary printout, right? These are the output shapes. And so the next layer takes this output shape as an input shape. And uh, so you need this build function and then you have the call function where you get the input so-called tensor. So you can think of these images, which I referred usually to as a matrix are called in TensorFlow tensors. And then you get basically your input tensor, specify it to the convolution matrix and then to the max pooling layer and then you put the tensor out and so what you can do now with this custom class is that i uh, initialize a new model so we have our input layer here so this time just as an explicit input layer then we have here the first convolution layer where we have again eight kernels three by three and automatically we apply the two by two max pooling then we have a 16 kernels three by three and then we have a I added another layer 32 kernels again three by three. You can initialize uh, then again the model flattening dense layers softmax layer compiling as we used to but since I have here now I have a convolution layer we reduce the number of parameters to 52,000 from what was it before I think 80,000 uh, where is it here uh, yeah, 85,000, we reduced it to 52,000. And then again, you can start the training and you see that you achieve almost the same uh, accuracy after some time. If we would train longer, we would achieve the same accuracy while reducing the, the number of layers quite a bit. So um, the same you can also do just for completeness also with the classification so imagine you we always had so far the 200 uh, um, the two dense layers one with 200 neurons one with 100 neurons uh, followed by the number of classes with the soft max and so since we always used it you can also define here your custom layer and uh, then you see that the sequential model already reduced quite a bit. And since we're also always initializing the very same model, you can also just define a function in which you initialize the model and then you return the model. And so now we have your sequential seven model 
and uh, you can also the, that's the nice thing with the sequen sequential function if you want to modify this model um, so I just called it now t you also can do it at any time so if you look at layers this is really just a list of layers you can see my convolution layers my convolution layers my convolution layers and my classification layer imagine I wanted to add a new another stage of convolution layers I could just add it with the usual python operation for lists and just inserting here another convolution layer into this model okay let's have a look a little bit more at our problem again so this was more of an academic exercise for these layers but sometimes it's really necessary let's look at our problem again so before I showed you the source position down here and the background position down here, but imagine if we already go to the upper side of our detector where the source is up here. The problem is somehow the same, if you like. It was just uh, mirrored uh, along here, this virtual line uh, around uh, y equals zero. And uh, so it should behave the same. But if we look at our images, you can see that the information is quite different if I would use the data as I did before. You see that instead of having this cone-like structure in the middle, I have now this divided cone. So you see that I have the cone here, but the cone here is basically chopped because the, the axis here is a circular problem. So this is the angular position. So if I would do now the convolution on this, I would use this spatial information that the information down here is actually connected with the image information up here and uh, this is only true if I apply this zero padding if I pad all my data with zeros before convolution I lose this partial information if I do the con convolution down here the the zeros here won't tell me what is the information up here and so what I need in particular case for my problem and where this custom layer design becomes important is I need a circular padding which is not by default offered by TensorFlow. I need a padding in which uh, the time domain, so information in this dimension, can be padded with zeros, and in this dimension can be padded with zeros. But in the y dimension, in the angular dimension, it has to be circular padded. So information which is down here should be padded according to the information available up here. And so this is. Uh, what I implemented and what I want to show you now uh, as the more or less last thing of this tutorial, how you can implement such a circular padding because this is not so trivial. Uh, uh, you need some time to understand how things work. So take for example, uh, some test images. First, we need to understand a little bit more about the, sh the tensor shape, which we had, uh, in, for example, in this example, you always see that we have a um, shape, which is called none. And then we have the two other uh, shapes, which was always the y, x, and the feature dimension, the z dimension, if you like. And this none basically means is that so far we always used uh, lazy, uh, uh, lazy patch sizes. So this means that during training, we want to say what is the patch size, what is the number of images we use for training. And this is why it's none, because we don't know it a priori what our batch size will be. You can also fix the batch size uh, for your neural network, but this has also then certain disadvantages because it will only then work for this particular batch size. And uh, so this is always what you need to know if you look at the shape. So you have, um, if you have an image uh, like up here and you ask for the shape, for example, if you just create a numpy array, in the first array we have three rows with four columns. And then we have another image with three rows and four columns. You see it's exactly like this. Two images, three rows, four columns. This is how we do it. Um, if you work with TensorFlow, um, you get a slightly different picture. So if you have these arrays, this is our used to picture. If you work with TensorFlow and put uh, make a very simple model, sequential model, just the input layer and use these test images in your input layer and look at the shape, you will see it's dimension two, 
two number of images, three rows, four uh, columns, and then you have this additional feature dimension, which you don't usually have in NumPy. And so here you have to already to think a little bit different when you work with TensorFlow or with your tensors, you always have this feature dimension in addition. So the first dimension is always given by the batch size, as I just said before, image height, image width, and then number of channels or features, if you like. And uh, so this you always need to keep in mind. So, and if we want to do the padding, uh, the, there's also default padding function in TensorFlow. There are many default uh, functions. Uh, you should look at also at them. You can um, apply them. And if we use now these test sensors, so I just use this model to input some images. So my test images, and I get back some uh, tensors. So these are now not any longer NumPy arrays. These are the TensorFlow tensors. I can use the padding function and the padding function, um, for example, this is the padding for the patch size. This is the padding for the uh, Y dimension, which we don't want to use. Here we want to use the circular padding. Then you have the dimension and time where we want to have the zero padding, which you see here. And then you have again the padding in the feature dimension where we don't want to have any padding. And so down here you see the output of the padded sensors. And if you check the shape, you see it indeed that the time dimension has now a padding of uh, what we specified of two. So um, for um, for the other padding, for the circular padding, we have to go a slightly different route. So the thing is about these checks what we do here with these tests is you always have to keep in mind that we know already the patch size which you usually don't know in your um, data so what you cannot do you cannot think of it like numpy arrays and you just circular padding is easy okay if i go down here i just assign the value which i need here according to the value here you cannot do some array assignment because you don't know a priori before you compare compile your model or before you apply your model, you don't know how the shapes will look like. So you cannot do it like this. And this means we have to do it uh, uh, the whole circular padding in a different way. Instead of assigning values, we do some concatenation here. So basically what we do, uh, we take now this zero padded array, we get based on the dimensions. So the first dimension, the patch dimension can be on, is on everything. The other dimensions are also not specified. So we're taking everything. Uh, we only take uh, the dimension, the, 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 the number of rows we need for the top padding, the number of rows we need for the bottom padding. And what we then do is we just stack our data on top. So we concatenate the top padding, the normal padded data, what we did here before, the time padded data, and then we stack the bottom padding data. And then you see that we get indeed what we want. So if you remember, our data had the shape one, two, three, one, four, five, six, six, six four, seven, eight, nine, seven. And so this means that on top of this row, if we do the circular padding is that we would first expect this row. And since we pad with two as a second thing, we would expect that row. And uh, so let's check. We have one, two, three, one. On top of it padded, we have indeed the last row and then we have the second row. So it worked. So this is really the circular padding. And you can here again see the dimensions we have now instead of three, we have three plus four, so seven as dimension. And this you can now convert down into a circular padding layer. And uh, this is over here. You can also look at the code. And uh, then you can also apply it again in, in a, this very simplified model to see that everything works out. And again, we see the circular padding with our test images is as we expected. And so we can implement it in our new sequential model. So we have our input layer again, we have this circular padding layer. And this time the convolution layer 
if you recall, we had always the padding set to same. This time we set it to valid. Valid just means don't apply any padding. So we have the circular layer, which is first doing our customized circular layer, which is doing the padding. Then we do the convolution, padding, convolution, padding, convolution. And in the end, again, our classification with this binary scheme, we can uh, initialize this model. We have the summary. You see it's the same number of parameters. The, the output shapes are also the same as before, so the padding works. Uh, oh no, sorry, this is the old model. This is for the comparison. This is the old model. Um, this time the same thing, but with the circular padding, and you see the number of parameters is the same, and the shapes of the convolution layers are the same than before. So you see that, that the circular padding works. And uh, to become more fancy, we can now make also our life a little bit more complicated. Instead of just having one source position, I just created 200 random source positions and two circle for, for mimic and background, for mimic and data, and uh, create then for these two source position images. Um, I create in this particular case to not blow up your memory. You see the entire notebook takes about six gigabyte of memory if you run everything. Uh, I create about 2,500 images per source point and then uh, do the training down here. And then you can see that uh, is also here is a comparison between the regular padding and the circular padding. So you see, although from a logical point of sense, it makes sense to apply the circular padding, it either it doesn't pay off right now. So we have to maybe train longer that it starts to paying off or the information is to, to spare that we can really use, make use of the circular padding, that this is really an information, an in, in important information carrier. This you have to check for longer epochs and when you make your data more complicated, but also this toy MC is uh, for sure not the best model. And uh, next step would be to use some real um, uh, Monte Carlo applications, like for example, GN4, which is often used in dark matter and uh, neutrino searches. And this brings me to the end of the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I hope you learned something. And uh, if you need any information, any help, please let me know or Chris know. And uh, thank you very much for watching.